Bonjour, nous allons donc démarrer cette conférence de presse qui se déroulera en deux parties. Une première partie sur les nouveaux OGM et puis la seconde sur les Monsanto Papers. Je donne la parole à notre député Bart Stas. Merci. Uh, bonjour à tous et à toutes. Uh, um, I will speak English. We have uh, interpreters um, for those who uh, do not understand English and want to listen in French. They have to go to number one. And the ones that do not understand French and want to listen to English, they have to go to number two. Uh, welcome to this um, press uh, meeting. Uh, indeed, in um, two parts, it's nearly a football game, with the, second, with the first half on, on the new GMOs. Um, you have to know that um, next uh, Thursday, so tomorrow, The Commission will organize a high-level event uh, in the, the Charlemagne building um, uh, with the Commissioners Hogan and Andrew Kaitis on uh, new biotechnologies that are for the Greens, the, the techniques uh, that we are campaigning on already since uh, 2015. Uh, and we uh, consider them as GMOs and we consider that those new techniques should fall under the current uh, GMO legislation. Um, this um, high-level event of the Commission will be uh, a very important moment in the uh, debate surrounding uh, these techniques. My uh, colleague, uh, my German colleague, Martin Häusling, will be uh, a speaker at the event tomorrow morning, and uh, several Green members will, will also be in the room. So we are following this uh, very closely. Uh, glyphosate and the, the old-style uh, GMOs uh, are today's uh, money makers for the uh, biotech uh, industry. Uh, of course, also it is also linked to the, the patents that, um, that are um, coming with uh, those techniques. And uh, in fact, they are um, uh, their strategy for the future. Uh, the biotech uh, industry clearly wants those new techniques uh, to uh, not fall under the current legislation, the, the Directive of 2001 and all the other uh, parts of the European legislation. Uh, we have invited as Greens uh, three people uh, that are very um, into the file, that are um, really uh, experts on the file. Uh, and I want to give them the possibility to, uh, to share with you uh, their experience. I have with me Ricardo Steinbrecher. She's a scientist. She represents the European Network of Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility. She will start. Then I will give the floor to uh, Daniel Evin. Uh, il représente le, la Fédération Nationale pour uh, une Agriculture Biologique. Et uh, pour finir, last but not least, I would say Francesca Achterberg from Greenpeace. So uh, let's uh, proceed. Um, Ricarda, Ricarda, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll try and keep it brief. I believe there will be room later to go into details. Um, just to briefly look at uh, what we are talking about. We are talking about the new genetic modification techniques, sometimes also referred to as the new breeding techniques. Um, they are a collection of different techniques, um, including transgenesis, including cisgenesis, transgrafting, but what we all really focus on is the so-called genome editing techniques, that is what is being discussed widely, uh, which are, for example, zinc finger nucleases, ODM, talents, and CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas, for example. Um, the, the focus of public attention goes into that direction, um, but for most of them, the claim stands, uh, the push is there, uh, as we just heard, to deregulate them, to exempt them from the regulations currently in place for GMOs. Um, ENSER, the network I'm representing, we've just put a statement out. Um, it's published today uh, on these products of the new genetic modification techniques that they should be strictly regulated under the GMO law. And uh, you find the arguments in there as well, but I will present some. The claim is often that the technique is so precise there can be no uh, 
unintended effects. It will only cut there and change the DNA at, the, at that specific site where intended. Um, we, we have to remember here we are talking about um, a substance, the DNA, that is linear, where all the information is stored of how to produce proteins, but it is just one level of, of, of how an organism works. There is many other levels which involve the gene regulation, how an organism interacts with other cells, with the environment, etc. So it's a complex system. All we are talking about right now is that linear strand of DNA, where there is, as scientists, we have like some ways of uh, making some very specific controlled changes, um, but it does not mean that we have all the knowledge of the consequences, nor do we have actually the knowledge about all the, the, the meaning of the DNA in front of us. Um, now, precision. We can, we can actually see uh, when we do the sequencing that there is a number of off-target changes that occur when using these modification techniques. For example, um, tests which were done in, in, in hamster cells or in mice cells, you will find that it will cut at the site where intended, but also at other sites that uh, were not intended at all. Now, there is for, for purposes of, of checking um, something which is referred to as an algorithm where they say, if it's similar to my intended target site, it might cut there. So therefore, these are the places I will check if something happened, right? So that's similar enough, let's check. And so that has become an assumption that it will only cut there. Yet um, Schaefer et al. and other papers have looked at the whole genome sequencing, which we feel as answer that has to be the basis of really checking what happened. You have to have whole genome sequencing and, and, and look the, at the changes. And they found that there is quite a number of extra alterations in there. Or Bratz et al., when they looked at oilseed rape, found that actually the, the construct which was used to get the CRISPR, the, 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 sister, uh, the, the molecule, molecular scissors, the CRISPR DNA into the plant, from, from that vector, at five, five different sites, you have actually insertion in the genome. So you get quite a number of different types of, of mutations, small ones and um, insertions, deletions, etc. Therefore, the claim for that only that will happen what is intended uh, is not defendable scientifically. Uh, the, the other argument often brought is that, oh, it's just a small change and it's such a small change which also could occur in nature. We just change like one base pair, one lettering in the DNA, or two, or three. It's small, it can, could happen. Therefore, it should not be regulated. Um, let's look at that. It's quite dangerous to think that just because it's small, it might be uh, harmless. It, it just remember like bacteria, you can have an ordinary bacteria, harmless one, you do a small change and it becomes a pathogen. Uh, in, in humans, healthy human, you have a small change in, in the factor VIII blood clotting gene and you have a hemophilia, you have uh, blood clotting disease or you, cystic fibrosis or cancer. You, you know, small changes actually do matter. Um, naturalness means it happens randomly. It might occur and usually we have like two separate alleles of, for the same information. So naturally, it only happens on, on one. With these methodologies, it happens intentionally at, 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 at place, and then it covers all the, the genes that have that. That's quite a difference, because if you do something intentionally, it means you actually are supposed to know what you're doing and the consequences of that, which actually is not the case, because we again and again find that um, with certain genes, we have a whole regulatory uh, cascade following, and we have changes in traits that were not intended at all. We should not forget that all the genes and all the, the metabolic pathways we have, they interact with each other. So if you change something at one place, it's like an ecosystem, it will have an effect somewhere else as well. Now, 
the main thing also to remember in that is, if you make one small change, which might occur in nature, and make another one, and another one at a different gene, either you do it in parallel or you do it sequential, you actually can create an organism that has never existed before in nature. Now, that is actually one of the main aims in developing these technologies, is to be able to make these deeper changes. That's also why CRISPR-Cas is a tool of synthetic biology, right? So, given that you, you can all these different, uh, do all these different changes, plus you have the unintended changes, it is actually mandatory from a scientific perspective to say, what are the risks and uh, what could be the consequences here? And do we know enough to actually um, ascertain what they are? So basically we say, we need precaution until we know everything is fine. And the indication in the moment are it's not all fine. So we need to have regulation in place that will capture this. We should also not forget that this development of these techniques is rapid. It changes every day. You, you, you open the papers, you have yet another um, way of using CRISPR-Cas or CRISPR-CPF, like different versions um, for different purposes or in different combinations. And in that, it is brand new. Every time there's something uh, different. So we have a developing technique which needs regulating. And regulation does not mean we are risk averse. But we should not forget, we've had a history of learning of, from, from late lessons, whether you remember like uh, thalidomide or asbestos, the mopping up afterwards of the, those mistakes is quite, quite a task and also it causes a lot of suffering on the way. And that certainly is something that will stop um, innovation, that will actually really stop things in their tracks. Whilst if you have good, clever regulation built on precaution with the aim of sustainability, you actually can guide innovation in the right direction. So that's what I wanted to share with you this morning. Thank you, Ricardo. So uh, after the, the meeting, uh, all of us are available for questions. And if you have very specific uh, questions, no problem at all. We are available. Daniel, la parole est à vous. Merci. Donc je voudrais tout d'abord rappeler que nous demandons, en tant qu'acteur biologique, mais je pense que toute la société également, que ces OGM sont bien, ces nouveaux OGM sont, doivent bien être réglementés à la fois pour des raisons légales au regard de la réglementation de 2018, mais aussi pour des questions techniques. J'aimerais prendre l'exemple de la, de la mutagénèse parce que beaucoup de, de pro OGM, on va dire, de, qui nous vante les mérites de ces techniques, euh, s'appuie sur la directive 2018 qui affirme que euh, les produits issus de mutagénèse, bien qu'étant déclarés comme OGM, sont exemptés de l'application de la réglementation et donc par là ne sont euh, ni étiquetés ni évalués. Mais j'aimerais rappeler que ces produits sont des produits issus de mutagénèse aléatoire, de mutagénèse in vivo, produits sur graines euh, entières ou sur plantes euh, entières ou éventuellement parties de plantes. Et qu'au moment de la criture de la réglementation de 2018, ces produits avaient été exemptés au motif qu'ils étaient cultivés depuis longtemps. Or là, on parle de produits nouveaux euh, et donc qui ne peuvent en aucun cas bénéficier de cette euh, exemption. De plus, ce ne sont pas de produits issus de mutagénèse. C'est un langage complètement... Euh, abusif, puisque les techniques qui sont mises en œuvre, notamment les techniques utilisées pour CRISPR ou d'autres euh, techniques, sont les mêmes techniques de laboratoire que celles utilisées pour la transgénèse. Donc on ne peut pas du tout parler de euh, techniques de, de mutagénèse, même si le produit final peut s'apparenter à l'endroit où on va regarder à un mutant. Mais comme l'a dit euh, Ricarda, il y a énormément d'effets hors cible, qui sont extrêmement importants à prendre en, cause, à prendre en compte. Donc c'est bien la technique qui va définir l'OGM et pas l'examen du produit final. Et en cela, nous demandons à ce que toutes ces, ces nouvelles techniques qui produisent, produisent bien des, des, des OGM et soient étiquetées, évaluées et tracées comme telles. Euh, 
Pour nous, il n'est pas question que ces produits puissent être mis en marché sans une évaluation, une traçabilité et un étiquetage. En effet, pour la réculture biologique, c'est extrêmement important d'avoir un étiquetage et une traçabilité pour ne pas cultiver ou faire consommer à nos animaux ces produits-là. Parce que s'il n'y a aucun étiquetage, on pourra même être amené, comble du fait, à acheter ce type de semence, si tout est déréglementé. Autre point essentiel pour nous, euh, la détection. Euh, il faut absolument qu'il y ait une mise, une mise au point des techniques de détection pour pouvoir savoir où se trouve ce type de produit et que l'on puisse se prémunir de toute contamination ou, en cas de contamination, de pouvoir être capable de mettre en œuvre des mesures correctives. En cas d'absence d'étiquetage, c'est la mort de la filière bio. Donc il est évident que pour nous, il est essentiel que tout soit étiqueté. Pour nous, ce qu'on va défendre, c'est que ces produits n'arrivent pas sur le marché, mais à minima, nous avons besoin de l'étiquetage, de la traçabilité, de la détection. S'il y a une mise au marché de ces produits, sans aucun étiquetage, les consommateurs vont complètement se détourner de la filière bio et nous allons disparaître. De plus, en l'absence de tout étiquetage, on ne sera incapable de voir un problème sanitaire ou un problème environnemental, parce que nous, les agriculteurs, nous, quand nous livrerons, nous livrerons tout en mélange des produits qui seront soi-disant bio, d'autres qui seront contaminés avec ce nouveau OGM, d'autres qui seront complètement des nouveaux OGM s'il n'y a aucun étiquetage. Donc c'est pour nous essentiel et vital. Et enfin, un dernier point euh, sur « a-t-on besoin de ce type de, de produit ?». Je dis « nous n'avons pas besoin de ce type de produit pour arriver à avoir des variétés qui soient de qualité » pour réaliser une agriculture euh, même performante euh, en bio. Hein. Les techniques actuelles sont largement suffisantes pour obtenir de bons résultats. Et euh, quand j'entends l'industrie semencière nous dire euh, que si on ne met pas ces produits-là sur le marché, euh, nous allons euh, disparaître, nous allons avoir de grosses difficultés, c'est le même discours que les mêmes industriels nous ont tenu il y a 20 ans, sur les OGM transgéniques en disant « si on ne peut pas mettre sur le marché des OGM transgéniques, nous allons disparaître du marché ». Quand je regarde aujourd'hui comment se porte l'industrie semencière européenne, elle va très très bien. Merci pour elle. We want to say one thing very clearly. These new techniques, which are sometimes called new ways of breeding, new techniques of, uh, uh, for breeding plants and animals, are uh, GM techniques. We're talking about genetic engineering. Let's be very clear about that. It, it's no need here to muddy the waters. There are no two ways about it. When we talk about genome editing, CRISPR, ODM, etc., this is genetic engineering. And so we join the calls for strict regulation uh, of these GMOs under EU GMO law. We've heard that otherwise um, the potential risks will not be assessed. That is essential. We've heard otherwise um, there will not be traceability or labeling of the products, and there will be no way, therefore, for consumers or farmers to avoid GMOs, which is something that the EU has only just recently introduced, and a possibility for um, countries in the EU to ban the cultivation of GMOs. Now, if GMOs are not recognized as such, there will be no way for these countries, for these governments, Uh, uh, to, uh, to do what their citizens ask them to do, and that is to avoid and to stop um, the cultivation of GMOs. Um, so that is essential. I would like to also remind us that genetic engineering so far, first generation as it were, has failed to fulfill the promises made by its proponents. It has not worked for the farmers, it's not worked for consumers or the environment. 
And we don't have any reason to expect that the new generation of GMOs will be any different in that respect and that it will deliver on these fronts. It's the same companies that are promoting new GMOs um, and that are likely to bring them to market. It's Dupont Pioneer that has announced a first CRISPR-Cas produced crop, which is a maize, GM maize, uh, with a higher starch content, supposed to come to market in three years. Monsanto and Bayer have both licensed the CRISPR-Cas technology for agricultural uses. And these companies are set to dominate the market for new GMOs as they dominate the market for all GMOs, for old style, conventional, as it were, uh, GMOs that we see in the marketplace today. Um, and their products will be just another prop for the, the chemical heavy industrial farming model that has worked for these companies, but not for anyone else so far. Uh, it's not delivered uh, the healthy food and the environmental protection that was promised. Um, and the farming model that this, uh, these products are part of, let's remind ourselves how it depletes the natural resources and the very basis that farming depends on. I think that is really important, that we cannot continue with these products and these, uh, you know, on the, uh, with farmers, um, buying and uh, depending on products um, like this that will, um, that will basically sustain the, the business uh, as usual. Importantly, we have alternatives today, so it's not like we have to discuss this and we have to um, find ways to use new GMOs as the Commission uh, in the program for tomorrow's conference is trying to make us believe. Um, Today there is hundreds and thousands of farmers who successfully practice seed breeding and farming that does work for consumers and for the environment. And the seeds developed by and for these farmers are cheaper. They provide resilience to floods and droughts and they deliver the high quali quality food that people want. So that's my call to effectively not you know, focus too much on, on the promises, you know, by, by companies that this is the future, that this is the solution to all our problems, mm -hmm. but to actually <coughs> spend the time and turn to real solutions. Um, the Commission has organized a full-day conference tomorrow on new GMOs. What we would like to see is a full-day conference on agroecology, on the solutions and the support they need um, from EU policy. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, to wind up, um, one of the things that I, I forgot to say is that Ricarda will also be a member of uh, the morning panel of the high-level right. uh, conference uh, tomorrow morning, so uh, she will be able to explain uh, her point of view on this. For the Greens and European Free Alliance and the European Union, uh, we have five very clear points. First of all, uh, we consider this, uh, these uh, new techniques as, uh, new, as biotechnologies, and uh, for us, their products are GMOs, point. Secondly, uh, the product issues issued from these uh, technologies should undergo a proper risk assessment. This is what has been said by several speakers. We are um, working and uh, requesting a full tracing and labeling of uh, these products. That is our third point. Fourth point, and this is also what you said, uh, Francesca, those new products are really not needed. Uh, we indeed believe in other techniques, in um, agrotechnology, and indeed, uh, if the Commission would be honest, she would also organize a full day event on uh, agroecology. And then our fifth point, the GMO regulation, where we worked um, very um, with, with a lot of efforts on uh, already in 2001, and then when uh, the whole regulation was rewritten um, in 2014-2015, we think that that new uh, that that GMO regulation should not be uh, rewritten, that um, those new techniques should not fall under exceptions 
the GMO regulation as it stands now should fully be applied to those uh, new techniques. That is our point of view. That is what we are fighting for. That is what we uh, uh, are saying in the parliament and that is what we uh, uh, will uh, vote whenever it comes uh, to the parliament to decide on what the commission proposes to us. Um, do we still have time for one or two questions? Yes, yes, okay. So Maybe uh, you say who you are, uh, what uh, press you, you represent. It's okay. And I would, I would like to give the floor to, to journalists, uh, because this is a meeting with journalists. Yes. Robert Hodgson from NZ Europe. I just wanted to ask if you have it, sorry. Robert Hodgson from NZ Europe. I wanted to ask if you have any idea of the Commission's thinking on, because there's, there's a court case at the moment going on in the ECJ, a uh, case brought in France about this precise uh, idea, and we're waiting for some idea from the court whether these products should be classified as GMOs. As I understand it, the Commission's supposed to be waiting until the verdict of that court case before deciding. Do, I mean, do you have any, have you received any indication of the way the Commission is thinking on this? Are you concerned that yeah. they are going to exempt these products from the legislation. Do you have any grounds for being concerned at this stage? Um, you may know that the Commission has earlier promised an interpretation of the law to say whether or not the products of gene editing but also other techniques are GMOs or not under EU law. For more than one it has yeah, yeah, pushed back the publication of that interpretation uh, uh, for a very long time. There's been a lot of lobbying on that, but that is documented, uh, among others, by um, Corporate Europe Observatory. Um, then the news came that uh, the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, will issue a preliminary ruling, including on one question that is related to uh, new uh, GM techniques. and. Since then, the Commission has said they want to have a broad societal debate. This is what the Commission uh, organized conference tomorrow is about. But they will, of course, not um, say anything about the legal status of these techniques. And I think that's good that they don't. Um, broadly, on that, on that ruling, I'm cautiously optimistic, I must say, that the court um, will, you know, um, classify um, genome editing, uh, of course, based on, on principles, uh, what, what falls under um, the, the, the uh, EU rules or not, um, but generally as, as GMO. It's also very interesting. It's also very interesting to, to, to look at the uh, discussion in, in terms of like, is the decision a legal decision mm -hmm. or is it a scientific decision? And in that kind of spectrum, again, it, it really needs the wider debate because what is at stake is really the protection and the obligation to, to prevent harm arising to uh, human health, to the environment, to the ecosystem. And whatever the best way for that is needs to be done. It's almost, it, it, if it falls in the dis, uh, definition or not, is almost irrelevant because it's quite clear what the task is ahead. But I, I believe there will be a lot of debate to be had, uh, no matter which way the decision will, will come out. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, Claire Leca, excuse me, uh, for the Monde Diplomatique. Oui. Uh, I wanted to, to ask you. Um, Vous pouvez parler français, hein, parce qu'il y a des interprètes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> merci. Um, Je voulais vous demander euh, quel euh, avis vous aviez sur la méthode scientifique utilisée pour euh, faire le rapport euh, du SAM qui a été publié cette année et qui va être euh, une base pour les débats de demain. I feel like the, the SAM report has just been like one contribution to it and um, I don't think it has yet really looked at everything yet. Uh, I think there was the intention. I don't think, I don't know whether they will be uh, given the mandate to go ahead with it. But uh, as it stands at present, um, it's not uh, sufficient for really being a basis uh, to, to move on, so. Encore d'autres questions? Oui, Marine. 
pour l'AFP. Bonjour, Marine Laouché de l'agence France Presse. Je vais aussi poser ma question en français. Je voulais savoir, je suis désolée si ma question est un peu basique, mais au niveau de la régulation, est-ce que c'est... Ces nouveaux, ces new breeding techniques vont devoir être approuvés euh, par le Parlement notamment comme les OGM ou euh, est-ce que tout va dépendre de la législation sous laquelle ils vont tomber The, the first thing that the Commission has to do is to take a decision on, on uh, under what regulation uh, uh, these new techniques will fall. Will they indeed fall under the uh, 2001 uh, uh, directive? Yes or no? Um, this is what we want. We think, uh, well, we explained it uh, with, uh, with the experts and also as Greens, that we think these are real uh, GMOs, so they should fall under that regulation. Now, there are uh, lobbies and the biotech uh, lobby, but also some member states who are lobbying to, um, to have those uh, techniques to, to not fall under, under, the, under the directive, under the, the, uh, the current uh, GMO regulations. So, and that is the real danger. That is why we are organizing this, uh, this uh, press uh, conference, because we have, I think, enough arguments to say that this is a, a risky business, that uh, we need tracing, that we need labeling, that uh, indeed there is a risk for society, and that uh, a proper um, um, inquiry on, on the effects of those uh, techniques on society, on farming, on environment, on public health is, uh, is really needed. And that is the whole debate. Uh, the Commission already uh, said, I think, immediately after the Juncker Commission started, that they would come with a, a legal uh, explanation on these techniques. Uh, they, they do not do it. They, uh, they are reluctant. That is also why they uh, changed a little bit, I think, from a more legal point of view to a, a more societal debate. Um, that is why there is the, um, the high-level conference uh, tomorrow all day. Uh, and we try to give our input into, into that debate. Le risque, si ça ne tombe pas sous la directive des OGM, c'est vraiment qu'il n'y ait pas ce passage pour l'autorisation des, 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 nouveaux, des nouveaux, problème, nouvelles semences, oui. que ça ne passe pas par les législateurs, en fait. C'est ça, oui. Et ça serait, bien sûr, pour certains gens très very fortunate. Hein? Already, uh, when you see what is happening with the actual regulation on GMOs, and the, uh, this, this commission, Juncker, uh, did um, authorize the imports of, of GMOs in, in, in a speedy way. Uh, if, you, if you see how many GMOs, imports of GMOs have been authorized by the, uh, the uh, Prodi and the two Barroso com com commissions, and you compare that to what the Juncker commission did, there is a, a huge disbalance. Uh, we, uh, I, I tabled with, with colleagues of all other political groups in the in, in European Parliament objections towards uh, the import and uh, the authorization of uh, cultivation of GMOs in the European Parliament. We always gathered two-third majorities. In the Council of Ministers, there is never a qualified majority in favor of those authorizations, and nevertheless, the Commission Juncker uh, continues in approving uh, new authorizations, mainly of imports of GMOs. This is uh, very undemocratic, we think, and it is totally contrary to what Juncker said on the 15th of July 2014 when he, when he did his inauguration speech in the European Parliament, where he said that he would democratize the um, decision-making process on GMOs. So this new de uh, debate on, on, on the new techniques is part of that, uh, of that debate, and we think it should fall under the regulation. Une, une dernière question, peut-être, parce qu'il y a encore d'autres gens qui, entre-temps, sont arrivés. You donc Isabelle Horry pour euh, Europe 1. Bonjour, euh, j'ai deux questions. Euh, si j'ai bien compris, là, il y a une audience à la Cour de justice le 3 octobre euh, pour les plaidoiries là-dessus. Est-ce que vous, du coup, vous avez un peu une idée de quand le, le jugement pourrait tomber Et ce que je ne comprends pas, c'est est-ce qu'une fois que la Cour aura donné son avis, est-ce que le débat sera réglé Parce que c'est ça que je n'arrive pas à comprendre. En fait, une fois qu'on aura une définition légale, non, ça ne suffit pas. Expliquez-moi ça, je n'ai pas compris. 
Francesca? I, I think once we have the ruling, the debate will only begin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because whoever, you know, will uh, lose out, uh, I, I think, will we'll restart the debate. But, but, and there are already attempts, I, I should mention, by the Dutch government, who basically assume the court will say um, cisgenesis, genome editing, etc., cetera, um, produce GMOs and should be regulated under EU GMO law. And assuming that that will be the case, they've already proposed a change to the legislation. So I think this sort of shows us where um, the discussion could go after the ruling. Government. This is... An outgoing government, eh? the Dutch? Yes, this is before they've even formed a new government. But, uh, <laughs> but yes, they've approached other, uh, other EU, country with, and EU countries with that. I just wanted to come back to the question on the current situation. Of course, we're talking at a time that a first product of uh, genome editing, you know, new GMO, is already on the market in the US and in Canada, and that is a GM canola that has been modified genetically to withstand... Um, uh, it's an oilseed grape, yes, a canola or an oilseed grape that um, uh, has been modified in such a way that it tolerates spraying with a certain herbicide. So it's, you know, the old herbicide tolerance. Importantly, um, when member states in the EU were faced with requests for field trials of that particular crop, um, they turned to the Commission. The Commission said, we need to look into this, we need to see whether this is GMO or not. Um, and the Commission said, so far, until we have clarity on the legal assessment, um, member states should allow field trials only under GMO conditions. <coughs> I, I think we have to, two, two points quickly. One important point is sort of we currently hear as a background to the, the claim that this should not be regulated, um, the notion of we need to have like the free hands to develop whatever we can speedily because we have to feed, you know, millions of people, there's climate change. So all of that as, as a backdrop is being set in order to, to, to give them like emergency uh, sort of, uh, sort of a free hand to, to deal with it. Um, we should not forget that what actually will provide sustainable and like proper uh, secure food um, is, is an agriculture that is resilient. That's an agriculture that actually is capable of withstanding with its own capacity uh, certain environmental conflicts and uh, challenges. So if we think we can just by changing the DNA a little bit and uh, keep modifying a plant but not actually recognizing that it is part of a bigger system, we actually have a bigger problem uh, at, at hand, especially when we keep thinking like, oh, more herbicides or we build in more uh, production of pesticides in order to, um, for, for the crops to be able to fight pests. We've had it before. Um, as a response, we have secondary pests coming up. We have even worse problems, right? So we need a regulation and a policy background that actually will be fit for the call of, of, of today. And um, as that, uh, just to, to, as the last thing to the statement, which you will find in your folder, like which was just published by ENSER and was signed by um, 60 uh, scientists. Um, will go towards, towards that, also saying like we really need um, to have a regulation that will fully embrace precaution and that will also be fully in, in line with sustainability because otherwise we will not be able to um, deliver what is required. Okay, uh, let's now change the Michel. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Do we take that with us? I guess so.
Yes, sir. Give me a lesson.